So, uh, ancient aliens, uh, rebutting alien conspiracy theories as popular alternatives to biblical history. Um, this is a, a recent uh, headline uh, from a UK newspaper, The Express, from May 14th, uh, 2020. Uh, headliner, new one in a million super earth discovered in alien life boost. Uh, subtitled Space Experts Have Spied an Incredibly Rare New Super Earth in a Significant Boost in the Search for Alien Life. Now, scientists reading this are probably thinking of, of alien life in terms of uh, sort of uh, microbial uh, life, perhaps. Uh, members of the general public reading that headline uh, probably immediately think of something a little bit more like this chap that I'm standing next to. Uh, from the sci-fi program Doctor Who. Uh, the article goes on to say that the, uh, the super Earth exoplanet, uh, that's a planet outside of our solar system, uh, lies close to the center of the galaxy. The planet's one of only a handful which have been discovered with both the size and orbit comparable to that of Earth, uh, which at first glance sounds pretty interesting, doesn't it? However, um, to lie close to the center of the galaxy is to be outside uh, what's called the galactic habitable zone because the center of the galaxy uh, has a tendency to be filled with much more radiation and black holes and things that are rather bad uh, for life. Um, it's a slightly controversial concept, this galactic habitable zone, uh, but much discussed uh, in the appropriate uh, literature if you want to pursue it and Certainly, um, it, it seems to me that uh, if you want to have a, a habitable planet, uh, your chances are higher in the, the middle of the galaxy rather than in the, the center or out at the uh, edges. They say the planet's only one of a handful uh, with a size and orbit comparable to that of Earth. Um, but what's actually been discovered here is a planet that has a mass somewhere between that of Earth and Neptune. Uh, that's the sort of range that we're talking about. Uh, and it's a planet with a year, as it were, a year of approximately 617 days. Uh, so it's not exactly comparable, it's just sort of vaguely comparable uh, to Earth, shall we say. Uh, the planet also orbits a red dwarf star, um, a, a much smaller, dimmer star than, than we orbit. Uh, and uh, a co-author of the study that lies behind, the actual scientific study that lies behind these, these kind of reports, uh, Michael Abro from the University of Canterbury, uh, reported by USA Today, uh, is actually quoted as saying uh, that this new super Earth, quote, would be very cold because it's stars smaller than the sun and emits much less light. Water could not exist in a liquid state and the likelihood of life would be very low. So you get a, a typical example here of the difference between a, a newspaper headline or a headline in something like Scientific American or uh, New Scientist uh, magazine and the actual scientific results in the actual sort of scientific publications and the kind of disjunct there of the sensationalist headline uh, and the more uh, prosaic uh, scientific truth. Uh, here's a, a nice example of uh, what we might call fake news clickbait in this area from the, the Sun newspaper uh, from 2017. Uh, little Green Amen. Nice pun in the title there. Little Green Amen. Does this painting prove aliens were present at the crucifixion of Jesus? Probably not. But that's what UFO watchers are claiming. Uh, and then the, uh, the journalist has cribbed something from a, a UFO website. Uh, you can see in this painting of the crucifixion here, these uh, strange little uh, figures here. And this is what the UFO website points to as, look, UFOs at the crucifixion. Well, as Nigel Watson, the author of UFO Investigations Manual says, there are numerous examples of what our modern eyes look like astronauts and spaceship in uh, ancient and religious artworks. Uh, what we have to understand is that artists in the past didn't adhere to literal representations of things, 
and often use symbolism to tell a story or to give greater meaning to a picture. In this crucifixion of Christ, the UFOs are representations of light, uh, representing life and darkness or death. Many artists painted the sun and moon faces or angels to represent these symbolic elements. Basically, there are no aliens to see here. But the impulse to, to reinterpret or to reinvent religious concepts by invoking extraterrestrial intelligences or ETIs uh, gains legitimacy in our modern world from the fact that speculation about alien life, including intelligent alien life, is a scientifically respectable pastime uh, in the field of astrobiology. And since the early 1960s, astrobiology has included an empirical uh, search for in, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence or, or SETI uh, as the uh, acronym goes. I think just as Christians need to say rebut the historicity of claims in the Book of Mormon, so they need to rebut alternative historical claims about so-called ancient aliens, uh, claims that offer some people with a secular worldview a sort of historical counter-narrative to biblical takes on history. Uh, I talk about this uh, when I'm talking about uh, the resurrection uh, in my recent book, Getting at Jesus, uh, and that then sparked me to publish the article that I've given you the link to, which will appear in uh, Theophilus, which is uh, the NLA University College Journal uh, in the next uh, uh, new edition, our supplement on science, natural theology and Christian apologetics, which I co-edited. Uh, Stephen Dick says it may be that as a, as a search for superior beings, the quest for extraterrestrial intelligence is itself a kind of religion for some people. Uh, and Michael Newton Keyes here from his recent book uh, on seven myths about history and the future of science religion called Unbelievable uh, says, he says the ET, what he calls the ET enlightenment myth, the idea that alien knowledge will radically revise terrestrial religion and philosophy. Thanks to recent astronomy textbooks, the ET Enlightenment myth is reaching countless classrooms in our universities today. Theologian David Wilkinson observes that this link between extraterrestrial intelligence and a religious quest has had a significant time in the last hundred years with various new religious movements built on the mythology of aliens. So just a few examples, uh, the science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard founded the Church of Scientology in 1952, blending an ancient aliens hypothesis with the uh, Dianetic self-help system. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, a chap called George uh, King claimed to have been contacted by an alien named uh, Aetherius and founded the Aetherius Society to promote the belief that Jesus was an alien. Uh, a modern day member of the society uh, called Mark Bennett uh, is quoted here as saying, it makes much more sense to many people to say that Jesus was an interplanetary being who came to earth to help mankind than to say that God created a one and only son who was also himself at a random point in history, who came to come to earth and forgive people their sins for some reason we don't really know. In the 1970s, uh, Eric von Dijkenen, famously in his book Chariot of the Gods and many other books after that, uh, followed uh, the Reverend John Miller in misinterpreting a vision of the prophet Ezekiel as an encounter with alien machinery. Uh, and as Christian philosopher William Lane Craig testified, he says, uh, when I was in high school as a non-Christian young man, I was really quite into UFOs and read a lot of literature on it. I remember seeing one article in a popular science magazine in which it claimed that Ezekiel's vision was of extraterrestrial beings in a sort of hovercraft wearing helmets and things of that sort that he described in a primitive way as having the face of the ox and the face of an eagle and things of that sort. To me as a young high school teenager at the time, it seemed very convincing that this is what it was. But you become a little more sophisticated and understand Jewish apocalyptic literature and symbolism, 
I think it makes it highly, highly unlikely that this is what Ezekiel was seeing, uh, that this was in fact a typical sort of a Jewish po apocalyptic vision uh, that he described. Uh, the Raelian religion, which is particularly big in Canada, uh, founded by Claude uh, Verhollen, aka Rael, claims that humans were created 25,000 years ago by aliens using genetic engineering, and that genetic engineering holds the key to eternal life for humans. Verhollen claims that aliens visited him in, 19, in 1973, uh, revealing this story of our history, uh, and commissioned him to prepare humans for the second coming of their extraterrestrial creators, teaching a message of sexual freedom and eternal life through science. Um, uh, Rael talks about the, the Ehalim have been, who created us, have been appearing to humans for millennia in the guise of angels or gods, passing on their message to humanity through human figures like Buddha and Jesus. And a prime contemporary example of this history reinterpreting ancient aliens myth is the TV documentary in inverted commas uh, Ancient Aliens uh, which has aired on the the History Channel uh, and or H2 since uh, 2009 and many people would agree with atheist Richard Dawkins that there probably is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe so a 2015 UK poll showed that uh, more than one in two people in the UK or Germany and the US uh, believe there's intelligent life out there in the universe. A 2017 survey of people in 24 countries showed that 47% of the respondents believed in the existence of intel intelligent alien civilizations in the universe. Uh, Russians being the biggest believers, 68%. Uh, the Netherlands were the most skeptical nation uh, about life beyond Earth with only 28% of Dutch survey takers entertaining the possibility. Still quite a high percentage. Another 2017 survey of uh, 1,700 Americans reported that 47% believed in aliens and 39% of Americans said they believed that aliens have visited Earth. They've probably been uh, watching the History Channel. And uh, this idea gains some plausibility uh, because space is big, basically. We are small, space is big. This picture just shows our galaxy. And so all of the other uh, star-like dots that you see in this picture beyond our galaxy, those are not stars, those are other galaxies filled with stars. There's an awful lot of space and an awful lot of room for other things beside us. Scientists trying to sort of get a handle on trying to kind of quantify perhaps how many aliens might there be out there. Uh, going back to uh, Frank Drake here and his famous Drake equation for organizing our ignorance, at least on this. He has various terms, each of which has a probability associated with it, uh, such as uh, NE, you know, the average number of planets uh, that might develop life on them, um, and so on. And if you just take that NE term, though, astrobiologist Lewis Dartnell says that he thinks complex animal life might only be possible around sun-like stars on a very Earth-like planet with plate tectonics and oceans of water, continental land, a thick oxygen-rich atmosphere and a large moon. But despite the discovery of some 4,255 extrasolar planets, no such planet is known so far beside our own. A point made by this uh, 2017 slide uh, showing the size of different planets uh, known outside of our solar system, comparing them to solar system planets here on the right and uh, orbital periods uh, on the other axes here. and uh, Earth-like worlds, uh, none known. But in April 2020, so very recently, scientists re-examining uh, information from the Kepler satellite uh, discovered an exoplanet that's probably the closest to Earth in terms of size and temperature and which orbits within its star's habitable zone where the temperature uh, would be such that you could have liquid water perhaps uh, if there were water there. Uh, Kepler uh, 1649c is the, the planet's name. It's about uh, 1.6 times larger than Earth 
it may have similar temperatures as it receives 75% of the amount of light that Earth receives from our sun. Uh, but due to a lack of information on the planet's atmosphere, it's unclear if uh, Kepler 1649c can sustain liquid water on its surface. Uh, it completes an orbit uh, once every 19.5 Earth days, and it's probably tidally locked, which means one side of the planet is always facing the star and the other side always facing away. Uh, so you probably end up with one side of the planet uh, hot, the other side very, very cold, uh, maybe a sort of small temperate zone uh, in the middle. The planet orbits a red dwarf star again, which uh, red dwarfs are prone, for example, to solar flare activity on a much larger scale than our kind of star is. Uh, and that solar flare activity could strip a planet of its atmosphere. Uh, so there's uh, all sorts of issues uh, with the habitability of Kepler 1649c as well. Uh, physicists, uh, physicists Anders Sandberg, uh, Drexler and Ord writing uh, in 2018 for the uh, Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University conclude in an article on uh, hab habitability of uh, other planets. They say when we take account of realistic uncertainty, replacing point estimates in the Drake equation by probability distributions that reflect current scientific understanding, we find no reason to be highly confident that the galaxy or observable universe contains other civilizations. Um, theoretical physicist Jim Al-Khalili notes that between 1995 and 2004, uh, Project Phoenix used radio telescopes to look at hundreds of sun-like stars within a couple of hundred light years of Earth without detecting any sign of alien civilization. Uh, this is the Kepler satellite that I, that I mentioned earlier uh, and uh, since Kepler our discovery of exoplanets has, has really shot up as you can see from uh, this graph here. Uh, but SETI is basically, it seems to me, accumulating a, a, a significant absence of evidence. Uh, in a, a 2013 astrophysical journal paper, uh, there was a targeted search of so-called Kepler objects of interest, planets of interest discovered by Kepler, uh, hosting 164 planet candidates judged to be the most amenable to the presence of Earth-like life. And they looked for narrowband radio emissions from those uh, planet candidates, but no signals of extraterrestrial origin uh, were found, uh, placing limits on the presence of intelligent life in the galaxy, said the authors. Uh, the 2017 Berkeley SETI Research Center Breakthrough Listen Project, uh, hit their first results from 2017 examined data on 692 stars from a primary target list of likely planets uh, and found again uh, nothing that originated from an extraterrestrial source. Uh, a 2018 paper uh, looked for uh, techno signatures from 14 planetary system uh, in, the, in the Kepler uh, field and uh, they again observed uh, nothing that uh, brought to their attention the idea that there might be uh, extraterrestrial the signals that they had captured. Again, in 2019, the Breakthrough Listen project submitted a more wide ranging and detailed analysis of over 1,300 nearby stars, uh, about 80% of their nearby star sample. Uh, and uh, again, uh, uh, Shostak, the, the senior astronomer there, says the bottom line of the new observations, no extraterrestrial radio emissions were detected. As well as investigating individual stars for techno signatures, uh, um, planetary systems uh, 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 and so on have been searched. Uh, people have searched at the, uh, the galactic level rather than just the planetary system around a star level uh, for the signature of civilizations that sort of span a galaxy and might be um, thought to use much of a galaxy's starlight to satisfy their power requirements for such a civilization uh, without finding anything. Um, so a, a 2015 Swedish study of 
over 1,300 spiral galaxies detected no signs of galactic scale civilization. Uh, a 2015 study uh, likewise found no thermodynamic consequences of galactic scale colonization. Uh, Scientific American reported that after examining some 100,000 nearby large galaxies, a team from the Pennsylvania State University has concluded that none of them contain any obvious signs of highly advanced technological civilizations. So there's this accumulating absence of evidence, and as uh, Steve Webb says in his book, uh, Where is Everybody? The continuing silence, despite intensive searches, is beginning to worry even some of the most enthusiastic proponents of SETI. And the simplest explanation of this uh, silence uh, is, as uh, astrophysicist John Grib Gribbin says, uh, the kind of intelligent technological civilization that's emerged on Earth may be unique, at least as far as our Milky Way galaxy goes. Um, Stephen Hawking, uh, in his uh, last uh, posthumously published book, asked, uh, so why haven't we been visited? Uh, maybe the probability of life spontaneously appearing is so low that Earth is the only planet in the galaxy or the universe in which it happened. Uh, another possibility that is that even if life gets started, he says, uh, most of these forms of life did not evolve intelligence. Maybe that's just very unlikely. Or indeed, even if you have life, even if you have intelligent life, uh, Gonzalez and Richards here point out that uh, the origin of modern science on Earth depended on a precise configuration of economic and cultural and philosophical and even theological precursors, uh, along with an unusually long-lasting and stable warm climate. You've got to have creatures with uh, manual dexterity and communication. Uh, you've got to have uh, oxygen-rich atmospheres, uh, dry land with concentrated ores in it that you need for doing science and then scientific experimentation and the development of technology and so on. Um, so what justification do we have for assuming that uh, technology and science and so on is an in inevitable result of life, even intelligent life, even if it does exist elsewhere? Even if you have intelligent life and even if it does develop technology, uh, what about them getting here? Uh, so here's an interesting paper I came across from Natural Science uh, from uh, Edelston and Edelston uh, in 2012, noting that as spaceship velocities approach the speed of light, interstellar hydrogen turns into intense radiation that would quickly kill passengers and destroy electronic instrumentation. In addition, the energy loss of ionizing radiation passing through the ship's hull represents an increasing heat load that necessitates large expenditures of energy to cool the ship. As you get faster, you get hotter. So stopping or diverting this uh, heat flux, uh, either with material or electromagnetic shields, is a daunting problem. Going slow to avoid severe hydrogen radiation sets an upper speed limit that would not substantially assist galaxy scale voyages. Uh, so they're pointing out basically that there are sort of hard physical limits uh, on uh, transporting uh, electronics or organic life in spaceships uh, at uh, any speeds that would get you very far uh, within even one galaxy. Uh, the atheist physicist Lawrence Krauss has calculated uh, in his book, uh, Beyond Star Trek, uh, that energy expenditures beyond our current wildest dreams would be needed to facilitate interstellar star travel and concludes that we probably don't have to worry too much about being abducted by aliens. Of course, some people uh, think they have been abducted by aliens or at least that they've seen aliens or seen UFOs, but upon investigation, the vast majority of unidentified flying object they see a UFO, literally, uh, those become identified flying objects of a non-alien nature. Uh, misidentified sightings of Venus or clouds or planes or secrets planes or birds or blimps or balloons or paper lanterns or helicopters or drones, etc, uh, etc. Et what about those close encounter claims there? Well, as psychologist Susan Clancy writes in her book, Abducted, 
how people come to believe they were kidnapped by aliens. She reckons that uh, alien abduction memories, so-called, are best understood as resulting from a blend of fantasy proneness, memory distortion, culturally available scripts, sleep hallucinations, and scientific illiteracy, aided and abetted by the suggestions and reinforcement of hypnotherapy. A lot of these alien abduction stories come from people who uh, remember their abduction whilst under hypnosis uh, uh, and under the sort of suggestion of the hypnosis uh, and the cultural scripts and so on, trying to make sense of their experience. And they, they produce this story uh, and hypnotherapy conditions. And Clancy argues uh, that that's not a reliable uh, source of testimony. Here's an audience question someone put to Bill Craig in a recent Q&A. Uh, they said, I do find the hypothesis that Jesus Christ was taken up into heaven by aliens to be as plausible as the resurrection. You know, I think one of them is absurd, but so is the other one. So what makes one more plausible than the other, at least? Well, I think uh, my research, and this takes me back to uh, my section of getting at Jesus, looking at the resurrection, different hypotheses to explain the resurrection, confirms Craig's reply, which is basically that in contrast to the resurrection hypothesis, the ancient alien hypothesis is, as he says, completely ad hoc. Uh, and doesn't do anything to illuminate the, the historical context. Uh, I think this is especially true, says Craig, if you've got independent reasons to believe in the existence of God. So we've already got the existence of a supernatural being in place when we come to the evidence for the resurrection. That would be analogous to if before we came to the evidence for the resurrection, you already had good evidence that there are these extraterrestrial aliens who came to Earth that would make the alien hypothesis more plausible if there was some evidence for that, but there just isn't. So I think the God hypothesis is much more plausible than that. Uh, back to the talk we just had from Stefan, uh, the, the explanation for miracle claims often depends a lot upon the context uh, that the evidence is coming from. So in summary, uh, ancient alien conspiracy theories are intrinsically convoluted and highly ad hoc and multiple essential facets of such theories are strongly disconfirmed by scientific evidence readily available from secular scientific sources. The scientific evidence suggests that at least on a naturalistic worldview, uh, extraterrestrial life is unlikely to exist. Even if ET life exists, it's unlikely it would develop into intelligent life or be blessed with the ecological and cultural preconditions for the development of science and technology. Even if technologically advanced aliens exist, there are significant barriers to interstellar travel. Even if technologically advanced aliens able and willing to engage in interstellar travel exist, it's unlikely they'd visit us let alone visit us in our pre-industrial past, let alone that they'd end up flying around the crucifixion, etc. The compound improbability of such a sequence of events is simply staggering. And not only do we lack evidence that aliens have visited Earth, but the SETI project has now provided observational evidence that technologically advanced aliens don't abound at the very least, at the very least not within our cosmic neighborhood. Uh, 